want to welcome to the show a good friend of ours that we met at numerous conventions. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. Dr. Muhammad Noor. Welcome, doctor. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be on the show. So we have to ask you, how did you trek yourself? <laughs> well, I grew up in southeastern Virginia, in the Hampton Roads area. And probably around the time I was eight or so, I saw my first episode of Star Trek. And I remember, I literally remember actually that first episode that I watched and I was just captivated. Was, this is amazing. It's, got, it's interesting because of the basis in science, but also the really cool plots. So, you know, we were on a trip at the time. When I came back home, I looked this up on my local TV station and I started watching it very regularly. And honestly, never stopped after that. So this was around 1978 or so. Um, I remember watching The Next Generation, like on the day the first episode aired, I was all very excited, like, wow, there's going to be new Star Trek now. <laughs> and basically watched every other series as it's come out. I've been in from that time all the way through. That's awesome. Yeah, that's just about like us, because we started watching in the 70s. And then, of course, we, yeah, been watching The Next Generation and all the shows since then. Yeah, same, same. <laughs> You're, you have a scientific career. Tell us about that and how you got into science to the point of making it a uh, living form. <laughs> sure. So I've, I've, my parents were both engineers, so that sort of gave me an interest in the STEM area more generally. But I guess for me, when I went to college at the College of William & Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia, and I, I liked biology, but I, I hadn't fully bought in. It wasn't until junior year I took this class called Evolutionary Genetics. And oh my gosh, I loved it. I used to record a lot of my classes so I could listen to them later to catch p pieces of the notes I'd missed. For Evolutionary Genetics, I'd actually play it back multiple times. I was so interested in the material. It was so cool. So that, that hooked me into that general area. I got my PhD then from the University of Chicago in Evolutionary Genetics, really trying to understand what are the changes in genes that have to happen for you to make a new species. And that's essentially still a big part of the research program I have right now. So now I'm a professor at Duke University. I'm also the Dean of Natural Sciences. But I have a, I have a research lab there that is doing you know, research on uh, re the process of recombination, the sort of genetic exchange between chromosomes, as well as um, what are the genetic changes that make new species. But I also teach classes in genetics and evolution, both for majors and non-majors. And it's all, it's all really fun. I really love it. That's fantastic. And as Star Trek fans, we met you to through Star Trek fandom and we've That's come right. to realize that if CBS has a question about biology tell us about the connection that you have sure so after I guess starting about maybe about I guess it was about four or five years ago I started giving talks at conventions about some of the science uh, as depicted in Star Trek series and after that essentially led to a whole series of other connections, which eventually led to uh, my connecting with some of the writers for discovering some of the other star current Star Trek TV shows. So now, periodically, I'll get an email out of the blue saying, hey, we have a problem. Would you be willing to do a consult with us? So then we'll have you know a conversation on the phone and maybe a couple of email exchanges. I'll do some research over the next week or so, trying to figure out like what's the best way to science out of this problem. So I'll give you a fictional example. Obviously, I can't give a real example. <laughs> I'll give you a fictional example of, um, let's say they had an alien species that they wanted to make turn invisible or something like that. So I would then try to figure out what are ways that maybe cells could go transparent or you know something about the biology there to help them science their way through the problem. And that's one of the great things about Star Trek is that they don't invoke magic very much. Obviously, it comes up every now and then, but they don't invoke it very much. They really try to have a solid scientific basis for what they're depicting. Now, every now and then, as, as any viewer would know who's watched a lot of Star Trek, every now and then they, they've had some, um, uh, shall we say, leaps. <laughs> but generally Yeah, speaking, we know some of it doesn't even sound plausible to us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but, it's, but most of the time, it's good science, though. Exactly. Exactly. And at least there's a, there was a heroic effort in there. <laughs> So let's talk about this book. Um, we have a copy of it, and it's wonderful. Uh, what I tell others about it is it's science, biology in layman's terms, and we need this so desperately. It's Thank entitled you. Live Long and Evolve, What Star Trek Can Teach Us About Evolution, Genetics, and Life on Other Worlds. You wrote this book. Tell us the motivation behind it. 
So this was building from my um, convention talk. So again, I was giving these talks at conventions about like why, for example, you might see so many humanoid aliens in Star Trek, aside from, of course, the obvious answer being that there's, there's human actors involved. But basically just trying to put like, well, could there be some way we could see life on some other world that looks like life here? So that was, for example, the first set of talks I, was, I gave was on that topic. But eventually I started adding more and more other little talks and pieces to it. And around that time, Princeton University Press approached me and they said they'd like that they'd like me to give a public outreach talk of some sort and to write a book associated with it. At the time, the most common public outreach talk I gave was basically why evolution is true on evidence for evolution. Unfortunately, there's already a book called exactly, quote, why evolution is true. And it's extremely good. There's no reason for another book on that topic. So the, the publisher asked, well, do you write, do you do any other sort of public outreach talks? And I said, there is something. This is definitely outside of your usual academic wheelhouse. <laughs> and I pitched this book and she was all over it. She said, this sounds great. I love this idea. So I then spent a year rewatching every, well, either rewatching or going through a script of every one of the 700 plus episodes of Star Trek. <laughs> Make sure I didn't miss anything. <laughs> And oh, that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> but it's framed, interesting, it's framed in terms of the chapters, very much paralleling the majors class that I give at Duke University, which is just called Genetics and Evolution. And it's, it's literally like topic by topic, almost lining up to that class, but pulling out examples from Star Trek that, that can be used to illustrate it. Star Trek, but the point is to give a narrative so that it hopefully will engage people into thinking like, huh, why would you see that? And then go into the science for why that could be the case. That, that's the goal from it. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. So after reading your book, and, and, and we find it very fascinating because you're, you're actually giving props to the Star Trek franchise saying they got some things really good, really well, but in other things, it has to be it's, – it's heavy on fiction. Yeah. So we're going to ask you some questions that you might help to, to clarify, sure. such as what is most likely the type of life one might find on another world? Uh, that's a great question. It's definitely not a humanoid. <laughs> I can start with that right off the bat. <laughs> if you were to go on some other world, the most likely thing you could that you would see, and this sort of parallels what was on Earth for, say, the first almost two billion years, it's most likely to be something microscopic. It's most likely to be some single-celled kind of thing out there. So this is a comment I've always said that if you're actually looking for extraterrestrial life, you can send signals out into space and listen for signals, but you're way better off like dipping some sort of spoon on, on uh, liquid in Europa <laughs> and looking for microbial life than you are for that. I mean, I, I strongly suspect the first life we find that's extraterrestrial will be something like that, something that's microscopic in, in liquid on Europa or, some, or Enceladus or one of those other moons. So having another humanoid species with pointed ears, that's the, the chances of that are pretty much nil. Very, very, very unlikely. <laughs> okay, now that leads me into the next question. The original series episode, The Paradise Syndrome, or the Next Generation episode, The Chase, y you get the idea that humanoids were planted yeah. throughout the universe. Yeah. Is and there anything that biologically that that would make sense? So that's that's a great question. So the let's start with the chase, for example. So people often cite the chase as like, oh, that's that explains why there's so many humanoids. So with the chase, the idea there was wasn't exactly the humanoids per se were planted, but that life was planted on all these different worlds four billion years ago. And and kudos to them that they actually said it was three point eight or four billion years ago in in both that episode as well as in the series finale for Next Generation. That's exactly about the right timing for life starting on Earth. And that's pre Wikipedia too, <laughs> but. In that episode, the idea is that, that life was seeded in all these different worlds. And somehow or another, four billion years later, you have that same outcome basically on Romulus and on Cardassia and on Kronos and on Earth. So that assumes that basically there's no role of chance events. That essentially that like the eventual outcome was entirely predictable. And we know that can't be true because there's so many bizarre chance events that led to us being here. So one simple example I always love to give is, you know, 65 million years ago, if you were on, if you were on Earth, it was pretty much the, the surface was dominated by large reptiles, which we call dinosaurs. We had this asteroid impact and a lot of volcanic activity, and that's what knocked back the dinosaurs and allowed mammals to become much more abundant and to radiate into different forms across the planet. And that's, of course, what led to us, among other things. Did that happen on 
at the same time on Kronos, on Cardassia Prime, on Romulus? Uh, probably not. There's a lot of other really big chance events that had a big, big effect in terms of shaping our outcome. So I, I, I don't think that example is particularly good. Now, Paradise Syndrome is an interesting one. So there, uh, the crew went to this planet. They found these Native Americans. That was a little strange. <laughs> but <laughs> whatever, we'll set that aside. But the explanation was that some aliens, I think they called them the preservers, had come to Earth and plucked some people up and plopped them down there. That's fine. I mean, you, of course, couldn't just plop the people down on, say, Neptune or something like that. You'd have to bring, you know, plants and things for them to eat and things like that and be a good environment. But in principle, yeah, you could take humans from someplace and have them go someplace else. Now, if you do a small tweak on that, rather than saying Native Americans, let's say rather than then, let's say it happened more like, you know, a couple of hundred thousand years ago. Let's say it was like Homo erectus or something like that. You could imagine in the intervening couple of hundred thousand years, Maybe on, you know, Bajor, they, there's some mutation that happens that, ha that makes you have little no brow ridges or nose ridges. Yeah, that's possible. Or maybe on Romulus, you got something that made ears a little bit more pointy. That's reasonable. Now, there is, there's one problem with that, which, I mean, the Vulcans and presumably the Romulans have this too. The one problem with that is this hemoglo hemoglobin, with, it's copper-based rather than iron-based. That would be a problem because that's a very, very big change. But the sort of physical manifestation differences, that actually does work pretty well. Yeah, it works well if, if people were seated on other planets, yep. like, like in the Paradise Syndrome, but, exactly. but for evolution itself, it doesn't work as well. That's correct. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well said. Okay. And so now we have to talk about the Voyager episode Threshold, <laughs> the one everyone hates. And this is, I think, even a, a six-year-old would watch this and say, this is silly. How did this get by the writer's room? <laughs> <laughs> that is a very good question. I, I've seen quotes from the writer saying, like, yeah, that wasn't our finest hour. <laughs> <laughs> so that was good this, acting. I'll give them that. I mean, the actors did great. But Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's some things about it were good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, I mean, traveling at warp 10 like they did. So could that <laughs> cause someone to evolve into an amphibian? No. <laughs> <laughs> just no, okay. <laughs> yeah, short version is just no. So it's interesting there that I, actually I'm working on a video that I'm going to post to YouTube soon about about exactly this topic. The um, they after Tom Paris came back, the doctor said that he had this high rate of mutation happening, and this is something that comes up not just in Star Trek but in almost all science fiction. The people who use mutation. Like it's this thing that just can make you change all of a sudden into this completely different form. That's not how mutations work. So there's two categories of mutations. In principle, they're kind of the same thing, but their effects are a little bit different. So you can, ha you can have mutations in you as a person as you're alive, right? And we do actually have mutations as our cells divide, and our cells divide all, all the time every day. You can have some change in the DNA code happen, and it does happen. Most of the time, it does nothing. If it does something, it's way more likely to do something bad than good. It's way more likely to, for example, lead to cancerous growth or something like that, or just lead to the cell just dying. It's not going to lead to you developing two good hearts. The other thing which was really weird about it is in that particular episode, um, Paris went through this change and became an amphibian, but then later Janeway did the same thing, and she also became an amphibian. So basically, the change was repeatable. The mutations are very, very random. Like, you can't easily predict, oh, like this gene is going to change in this individual in this way, and then have that repeated in another individual exactly the same way. That that would never happen. <laughs> so, yeah, this is... So if this, you had been... Oh, sorry. If you had been the, um, like the biology advisor for that episode, <laughs> you would have had them do something different, right? Oh my gosh, I would have tried really hard. <laughs> <laughs> I would have tried very hard. The other thing too is the speed of change. You know, the, you know, Tom Paris, like, I think it was within hours, within a day, he all of a sudden had a second heart. Heart cells divide something like, I forget, once every couple of months. You can't just grow another heart and it's working and it's all fine. <laughs> like, that would never happen. <laughs> and and yeah. I have to, to mention how impressed we are with the layout of this book because you start right at the beginning of the original series and you break down episodes. You actually list the episode name and what the biological realities of it could be or, or, or is. You really you really do give it positive feedback on, on many ways that Star Trek got it right, but then like this episode when it comes up, you say, well, there's some times where Star Trek just really got it wrong. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I was trying to be nice to you because I mean, I'm a Star Trek fan. I mean, I'm not, I don't want to throw stones at it, but 
every now and then like mm, okay there's not there's not really much saving grace here <laughs> when you go to something like threshold <laughs> except that it was a, except that it was a fun episode and honestly i mean star trek's not a documentary as much as i wish it was <laughs> <laughs> so it's not it's not intended for science education so in the end if you have an interesting plot you know they still won and kudos to them for at least trying to do science <laughs> Okay, so, and then now there was the TNG episode Genesis, where the crew de-evolved yeah. into earlier forms of life. Now, what yeah. do you think about that? So, is it, it was an interesting concept. So, I'll, first, let me start with the good side to it. The good side to that is this episode very explicitly acknowledges the common ancestry of all life on Earth. And that's something that, you know, for example, here in the United States is not something broadly accepted. I mean, just, you know, it's outside the scientific community, obviously within the scientific community, it's very solidly accepted, but outside it, it's not. So that was very positive in the sense of like, yes, we have ancestors that were primitive primates. Yes, we have ancestors, shared ancestors with, say, spiders and iguanas and things like that. So that two thumbs up for that. Um, they tried some things there. There were a couple of things where I think small tweaks would have worked. So, for example, they used the word introns. I think that's what started the whole thing was Barkley had his introns activated. But then Data gave this definition of introns. It says something like evolutionary relics. They're genes that used to have a function but don't anymore. That's actually not what an intron is. An intron is a real thing, and it is really in genetics. But what he just defined there was a pseudogene, not an intron. So that's a very small tweak that, like, for example, as the writer, I could have said, oh, no, don't say intron. Say pseudogene. That's an easy fix. The de-evolving piece, uh... <laughs> the problem is when you have these things, these evolutionary relics, if, as you can imagine, if you have a gene and it has no function, let's say mutations arise in it, there's no reason for those mutations to be eliminated. There's no natural selection purging them. So even though we have pseudogenes, they've been you know, dramatically destroyed over time by lots and lots of mutations. You can't just activate them and then become this ancestral form. Um, it did also have one, it did reflect one common misconception. And I'll, I'll, even though it's wrong, I'll grant the, the Star Trek writers that it's a common misconception. People often confuse the difference between common ancestry with existing species and the, um, what our actual ancestors were. So, for example, we share a common ancestor with chimpanzees. That does not mean our ancestor was a chimpanzee. It's the same as thinking like all present day species are kind of like all your cousins. But you do not descend from any of your cousins. You just share a common ancestor with your cousin. You share grandparents and great-grandparents with them. So that was something that got a little bit wrong, for example, when Barkley started de-evolving into a spider. No, we do not have any ancestor that was a spider. But we share common ancestors with spiders. But that's a very common misconception. So, I mean, I get why they got that wrong. That's, you know, that's, mm -hmm. they're not scientists. It's fair. They, they had to make a good episode, so exactly. they did. <laughs> exactly. It was fun. <laughs> it was well done. So we see a lot of hybrids with humans on Star Trek. Yes. So is that possible? That's a great question. So if you go back, so this is coming back to one of the things that we brought that you brought up earlier. If you go back to this paradise syndrome explanation, that let's say that for example, um, human uh, humans were, or humanoids were taken from Earth a couple hundred thousand years ago and put someplace else. That's a pretty recent shared ancestor, and if we assume that's true then, in fact, we know for sure that you, you potentially could have hybrids and, and fertile hybrids even with them because um, we know this happened here on Earth with humanoids here on Earth, that within the last 100,000 years, primitive humans interbred with Neanderthal, interbred with another ancient hominid called Denisovans. I mean, we know this interbreeding was happening on Earth. There's no reason to think it couldn't happen with an alien form that was taken from Earth around that time of shared ancestry and, and put someplace else. So with that explanation, you could. And in fact, you know, people think of hybrids as really, really rare. And they're rare in the sense that it doesn't happen willy-nilly, but if you look across animal species, there was a recent review that looked at this, if you look across animal species, something like 10% of them occasionally will hybridize with another species. And when I say occasionally hybridize in 10%, I don't mean the 10% of the time they do it, but 10% of species will, <laughs> not 0% of the time, <laughs> make a hybrid. Kind of like the, the example we always use is like horses and donkeys. Horses and donkeys can make mules. They don't do that all the time, but they can do it. Hmm. So in that regard, it's not, it's not as crazy as it seems if you use that explanation. Now, if you assume sure. we share a common ancestor four billion years ago, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> we, literally have, uh, we literally are more closely related to grass than we are to Vulcans based on that explanation. And we don't make hybrids with grass, I hope. <laughs> right. So, so, yeah, so humans couldn't really... Um, 
you know, intermingle, interbreed with another species if it was a completely alien species. If it was something from, you know, say millions and millions of years ago, no. But if it's, say, from a couple hundred thousand years ago, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So something like uh, Spock. Yeah. Well, what about with, with scientist intervention, though? That Because that's a lot, that is always that's a different fandom thing. that Spock, that Sarek and Amanda yep. had, had to have um, scientific yeah, sort of intervention. Help. Yeah, it really depends on how much intervention you do. Now, for example, like, you know, could you, you could, I mean, you can move genes, and this actually sometimes happens, you can move genes, you know, from a bacteria into an animal, you know, that, so and they're obviously not at all close related. So if you call the resulting thing a hybrid, then sure, yeah, you could do it with anybody. <laughs> but if you mean literally like it's half Sarek, half Amanda, then, you know, there's some base level, like you have to have the same number of chromosomes. They have to, they have to be at least, kind of similar so the the sarah and amanda thing i always interpret that more in the context of something like maybe the sperm from one species doesn't very well fertilize the egg of the other species something more like that as opposed to actually like taking out or manipulating genes per se but maybe it could be a little bit of that it could be the, maybe something that, that would normally cause the hybrid to be inviolable they were able to edit one or two genes to do it okay so you said so then like maybe it could even if even if um if Sarek had the uh, the copper-based blood, which is completely different from human yeah, blood. Yeah, that's a tough one. Because, I mean, you wonder then, like, what, is, what does Spock have? Does he have copper-based? I mean, they call him green blood. It implies he has the copper-based blood. <laughs> yes, yeah. So maybe, so maybe they took that out completely from Amanda's genome. <laughs> that's a tough one, though. Because <laughs> you have to imagine, you know, what's going on in utero there when, like, you know, Spock is inside Amanda. Maybe or maybe, he, maybe he never was in utero. Maybe they he was artificially fertilized and put into some sort of chamber, I guess. Hmm. So I guess you'd have to Quite do that. Cause that <laughs> yeah, because otherwise he'd be getting otherwise he'd be getting her blood on her and then like that's not gonna work. <laughs> we noticed that in the book you still uh you you're you're up to date with Trek regards to discovery and yep. talking about tardigrades. Yeah. And I love how you actually break down the science of tardigrades i never knew about tardigrades until i watched discovery and then i realized that wow this is a thing can you explore that a little bit more sure sure so the tardigrade thing was really interesting the, the tardigrades are really cool in that people describe them as something which can live in the vacuum of space now that particular statement is often a little bit overstated in in like popular media and stuff like that. Um, there are some studies which have actually exposed tardigrades to the vacuum of space, and it's true, not 100% of them die, but it's something like 99.5% of them die. <laughs> so, they're not that resistant. They're just you know not immediately all killed off. So that aspect was good in the sense that they did actually pick something which is true, but it's maybe a little bit overstated. Targets are really cool because they can also completely dry up, which is really neat. And that's part of how they're able to survive in, in the vacuum of space, because that's one of the issues with space is, you know, you, you have all your liquid just sucked out right away. Um, one statement they made, though, and this was actually this was a positive, but it was wrong. <laughs> One statement they made in an episode was, was uh, Michael Burnham made a comment about like its microscopic cousins on Earth, the tardigrade acquires uh, parts of its genome from horizontal gene transfer. Now, horizontal gene transfer is literally getting genes from a completely different species. It's kind of like what I was describing earlier when I mentioned something about how you can have bacterial genes go into a human. That would be an that would be an example of horizontal gene transfer. In 2015, there was a paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences by some researchers from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And this was the first genome sequence of the tardigrade. And they said, wow, look at that. Something like 17% of its genome actually came from other species. And this hit the news. It was all over the place. And that's, I think, where that statement came from that's in Star Trek Discovery. Unfortunately, <laughs> science tends to self-correct. And the next year, there were a bunch of papers which showed why the analysis was done wrong. They didn't get nearly the same publicity in like the New York Times and things like that. So the Star Trek writers didn't know about that. So <laughs> it was a good, I mean, again, I'll give two thumbs up to the writers that they were actually trying to incorporate some cool new science fact. They just didn't go back and check and see, oh, wait, that fact actually got disproven in between. <laughs> but in terms of interesting, in terms, yeah, in terms of the book itself, it was funny because I actually wrote the entire thing and turned in the first draft right before Discovery aired. But then you know, that first season aired while my book was out for review. And there was so much good stuff. I was like, oh, my gosh, I totally want to work this into the book. I totally. <laughs> oh. so, when it, so when it came back from peer review, 
I added in those extra pieces in there. So that if those pieces seem a little bit forced, that's why, because the book was completely written without them. And those got added in right after the first round of peer review. But then I got it in, bef- uh, I got it in that before the second season came out. <laughs> I think they're great. They didn't seem forced at all. It's actually what I love about the book too, is that you're incorporating some of the graphs and charts that you use at the conventions yeah. Because I'm a visual person. And, and once you start drawing pictures, I'm saying, oh, it, it, it makes more sense now. And, and really love this book. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. It was really fun to write. <laughs> so tell our listeners how they can attain a copy of Live Long and Evolve and how they can view your other media. Sure. So, I mean, the, the book Live Long and Evolve is, is through Princeton University Press. It's available on Amazon.com or if you go to the publisher's website or honestly pretty much any publisher, like, any bookseller. Like if you go to Barnes & Noble, you can pull it up from there. Just search for that title, Live Long and Evolve, What Star Trek Can Teach Us About Evolution. Just type the first part, Live Long and Evolve, and it'll come up. In terms of following me or my media, easiest thing is, is to honestly follow me on Twitter. Uh, and my Twitter handle is at M like Michael, A like Apple, F like Frank. My last name, Noor, and like November, O-O-R. So at Moff Noor. That's the easiest way to follow. Awesome. Well, we look forward to seeing you in real life at a convention, hopefully sooner than later. And we want to thank you for your time and this awesome treasure that, that's on our bookshelf and, and we think should be on every science fiction fan, not just Star Trek fan, every science fiction sh- fan's bookshelf. Oh, you're very kind. Well, it was, it was great talking with you, and I hope, I hope to see you in person at a convention sometime soon, too. Thanks for listening. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and join our Facebook group. Live long and may the force be with you. Nanu Nanu.